I don't normally talk about the technical side of time splitters, but I think it's something that should be covered because there's a topic that's been on my mind since I started modding the games and digging into the files and everything, looking through it through a hex editor. Something interesting is just how optimized the games are, especially Time Splitters 2. That's going to be the main focus here. Free Radical's been pretty adamant in interviews and magazine stuff back when the Time Splitters games were being made about how smooth they wanted the game to run. They wanted it to hit 60 frames per second as much as possible. A smooth, multiplayer-driven focus, even with bots, even in story mode with co-op going on. And sure that it wasn't always achievable, like in Future Perfect, especially with the map maker, the game can kind of chug at times if the map's big enough and if enough is going on. But by then they were dealing with aging hardware, so you can only do so much. But Time Splitters 2 really showed just how creative and crafty they got with finding ways to make sure that no matter the cost, no matter what, it would look good, run 60 frames per second, and be a solid multiplayer experience. And the more you dig into the inner workings of the game, the more you really see this, like through extracting packs and looking through the files there. I want to dig into that in this video. Time Splitters 1 the first game Free Radical made, I mean, the second site was being worked on then, but it probably wasn't as far along. Time Splitters 1 mostly runs well, but it's also kind of rushed. And it kind of shows in the way that it loads everything when a match is started, whether it's story, arcade, or challenge. It's why loading times are so long, because the game pretty much loads every asset when it doesn't need to. So Time Splitters 2 goes ahead and cuts down stuff like that. It only loads what's necessary for the most part when it comes to textures and other things of that sort. Like if you look into the files for each story mission, there's only like the weapon models, weapon textures, the characters, things of that sort that are only relevant to that level in of itself. There is a bit of unused content here and there, like how there are uh, two of the female characters in Wild West that never show up. We can assume that was from an earlier build or an earlier concept where they were present. Otherwise, it's pretty strict and to the point. What's necessary is what's loaded and nothing more. The same goes even for Arcade. Outside of the five weapons you pick in Time Splitters 2 Arcade, like, the projectiles load, but the textures don't load with them, nor do the sounds. Only the stuff you pick is loaded. Only the data associated with those weapons is loaded. Speaking of weapons, something that's really clever is the fact that Time Splitters 2's weapons share a lot of related textures. Now, the third person models the lower detail ones. They have their own textures, which makes sense. It's one big texture for the whole model just trying to map it all out. But for the other guns, it's broken up to save on memory. So like, the wooden parts on the Soviet S-47 are also used by the grip and the handguard of the Tommy gun. There are metallic parts on the Tommy gun that show up on the laser gun, and some of the metallic parts on the electro tool also show up on other guns. The magazine for the Soviet S-47 is also used by the turret, the texture for it, and like there are some unique textures like the Electro Tool's yellow parts are only used by the Electro Tool, but there's a lot that is shared. And this also goes for characters, the military especially, wherein the privates, sergeants, and lieutenants all have the same body textures. Same for the captains and troopers. The lawyer, accountant, and consultant all use the same body texture. The only difference is the face texture and icon. And the Neo Tokyo civilians, like the 20 unique characters that walk around the streets of Neo Tokyo, they all use the same textures. Their models are different, but the textures are applied in different ways to make them look unique. The only difference is in the face model. It's crazy just how much they save on by applying these same assets in unique ways. The sounds also have some shared aspects among them, like the 
Firing sound for the Soviet S-47 is the same as the tactical 12 gauge. Some firing sounds sometimes blur as one in return, and some are used by the same guns, like the rocket launcher and the homing launcher also use the same firing sound. Going from there, Mapmaker has its own unique texture saving aspects. The models for Mapmaker are pretty unique for the most part. However, there are still elements that come from other aspects of the game, like the Mapmaker auto guns that only appear in story levels. That's basically a Tommy gun enemy, a stationary one that rotates around, but if you change the stats of the Tommy gun, that is directly affected and it'll be changed accordingly. If you make it shoot sewer zombies spit, it'll do that. For the Tommy gun as well. Not to mention how the industrial and alien tile sets, both of their texture sets mostly come from Neo Tokyo and from Planet X. The spaceship interiors of Planet X are used for the alien tile set, while the industrial tile set comes from the Neo Tokyo sewers. And the multiplayer maps, some of them are just straight from story mode, like Aztec is a port of the Aztec Ruins level from story mode. The Robot Factory speaks for itself. It's the final section of Robot Factory just blocked off from the boss area and everything. There are plans to do this for more levels, like you can see Siberia has its own arcade setup that is in a couple of challenges. Wild West has an unused arcade setup. Notre Dame is a very unfinished one, but it shows that the lengths they're willing to go to not create a bunch of new assets that are only going to be used once. Which is why some aspects of streets were given a Neo Tokyo-like vibe, because there were a lot of unique signs and things like that that are just cut down to save on excessive unique textures used. A lot of the game is built around stability and speed. You might not move as fast in Time Splitters 2, but the developers were keen on making sure that the game would go as fast as it could, as often as it could. Even with multiple people playing the game, even with up to 10 bots playing, even with weapons being fired, lasers being used, auto guns being active, Free Radical wanted this to be an incredible multiplayer experience that ran smoothly no matter what. And it does! It's incredible what they did, like, the amount of culling, that is another important part. I didn't even realize it at the time. When you glitch out of bounds in Time Splitters, you notice that the game doesn't load a lot of the rest of the map. It's often just a block of the area that you were in. And that's because that's all that's loaded. The game aggressively calls areas that are not loaded. If you are not within sight, of an area of the map, there's a chance that it's unloaded. Like, I mean, the um, geometry is there, the physics mesh is there, you can walk around with collision and everything, but no textures are present, and chances are the effects aren't showing up either. That way the game can save on memory, it will only focus on what's present. If you glitch out of bounds at the waterfall and training ground, it's only going to load the waterfall area, even if you maneuver around. If you go back in bounds after doing that, it won't load the rest of the map unless you get back into the area that you started at, the waterfall area. And that applies for a lot of other out-of-bounds glitches too. You can see that Free Radical made sure the game would run smoothly by unloading as much of the other map as possible without necessarily impacting the way it plays, because there still might be bots in that area fighting each other, there still might be other players there. But from your perspective, it looks like the entire map is present, but in actuality it's being unloaded and loaded as you make your way through. That way the game can conserve its resources and only show what needs to be shown. And that's just so clever! I mean, I'm gushing about something so technical, but I can't help it. it shows the ingenuity on Free Radical's part. What they were willing to do in order to make sure their game ran smoothly. And I think that's what I wanted to talk about. Just how inventive Time Splitters 2 is. How ahead of its time it is. 
The art style is pretty future-proofed. It's not amazing, but it still looks pretty nice compared to realistic games of that era, even ones I like, like Call of Duty Finest Hour, which haven't aged the best compared to Time Splitters 2. They really thought ahead with this one. They knew what sort of hardware they were working with, and they made the best of it. And because of that, it's probably one of the best running games on the PS2. And even better on the GameCube and Xbox versions, because they've got more powerful hardware to work with. Anyway, that was just the main focus. I wanted to talk about technical aspects of Time Splitters 2 and the technical achievements of Free Radical Design. Here's hoping that we'll have another Time Splitters project in the future. One that can show the creative nature of Free Radical and its employees. Take care.